Okay, the children are quietly dismissed. If you open your Bible to Psalm 144. Is there any way, uh, Stephen, could you pull up um, 1 Samuel uh, 18, 19? And, uh, but open your Bible to Psalm 144. We're actually starting there. Uh, my Bible fell over to the scripture yesterday, and uh, I went looking for a sermon. Look at this. Isn't this an unusual scripture? It says, so it came about at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Maholothite, for a wife. And I thought, boy, they're real definite. Whoever wrote Samuel, I guess it was Samuel, I believe, was real definite the fact that Mirab should have been given to David. I thought, I wonder why. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, she was his reward for killing Goliath. And then I'm, I'm going somewhere else in my Bible, and I'm thinking, that's right. When you fight the word battles, there's spoils to the battle. Mm -hmm. and I never thought that thought in my life, because you see, if you go back to what we talked about Sunday morning, we talked about the fact that you are redeemed, and you need to learn to fight for your redemption rights, right? Yeah. You, every cell in your body is redeemed, your spirit's redeemed, your emotions, right? Hallelujah, do you have a little happy guy you can flash up here? Uh, but have you ever, ever, ever thought about the fact that when you yeah. fight the Lord's battles, there's rewards? Hmm. That's a thought, right? You see, we're, look at Psalm 144. We'll start there. I want you to hold that thought because, you see, you and I both need motivation to fight the Lord's battles. Why? Because fighting isn't always that fun. All right. Oh, you don't have to pull a little guy up. We'll just go to Psalm 144. I just thought he was cute. <laughs> He's my screensaver right now at home, so I think. Hallelujah. Have you ever wanted to be more victorious? You ever wanted to walk in the victory he bought for you? Well, look at what David said in Psalm 144, verse 1. He said, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now, think about this. Are we promised military mentorship from the supreme warrior of the ages? Is the Lord the supreme warrior of all the ages? You better believe it. it you can forget the, the uh, can we just go back to the scriptures or it's not working? Oh, scriptures over here. Thank you very much. All right. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains. You've got a personal trainer. Yeah. Not for your body, but for your warring hands. Now, a lot of people don't think of the Lord as a warrior. They, they see the pictures of Jesus carrying the lamb about. That's how he treats you. But that's not how he treats the enemies. Look at what Exodus 15, 3 to 4 said. They had just, he had just drowned Pharaoh's army. He said, read this with me. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his armies he has cast into the sea. And the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Now, I'm going to talk to you about doing warfare tonight. And you have to know that when you're warring the enemy, God wants you to be full of vigor, precise, and triumphant every single time. Okay? The Lord is, there is no military coalition that can successfully stand against the lordship of Jesus Christ or his supremacy. They will try in Armageddon, but Psalm 2 says he sits in the heavens and laughs. All right, look at what Psalm 2 says. It says, the kings of the earth take their stand against the rulers. And, excuse me. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart. Now, I mean, this is exactly what the United States of America is saying to you. Right? Yeah. Forget the rules. We make the rules. Right. If we think two men should have a baby, two men are going to have a baby. Sort of. <laughs> When are two men ever going to have a baby? But they got to change every rule. If I was born a man, I'm sure I should have been a woman. That's what it means when it says, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Who's he speaking to? The Trinity. Next verse. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Is God shook? God terrified by gate? No, pray no. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. And we'll stop there. That God is going to win the battles. Let's just look at Armageddon really quick. And then we're going to get, uh, go on to tonight's subject, Revelation 16, 16. It says, they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. 
And then in Revelation 19, 19 to 21, it says this, And I, John, saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assemble to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Okay, one more verse. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from his mouth who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now, why do we read that? That's kind of off topic, and I admit it. But I just want you to understand that when in Psalm 144, when David said, He trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, we're talking about the greatest warrior of all time, the one who will never be defeated. And if he's able to train your wars, or your, your hands for war and your fingers for battle, he's able to help you win every single one of your personal battles and then go right on to fighting the Lord's battles. Yeah. Hallelujah. Whose battles is he preparing you to fight and win? First yours, then his. When you can go to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to be there quite a while. Oh, I like this message. You know why? Because something in us says, look, if I can get myself on track, I just don't have the energy for anybody else. You can tell when you're starting to get really mature in God because it, most of your prayer time is for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And um, 1 Samuel 17, look at verse 33 to 37. Um, David was just a kid, but he learned to fight his own battles with the Lord's help. He's speaking to Saul here. 1 Samuel 17, 33, that Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are but a youth while he is but a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Now, please think about this. Whose battle was David fighting when he killed the lion? It was his own battle. It was his responsibility to guard the sheep. That was David's battle. By whose power did he learn to fight and win his battles, according to verse 37? The Lord. He learned to fight his own. I'm hoping you can follow this. Because you're going to learn to get healthy by the Lord's power. And then you're going to learn to get successful financially by the Lord's power. Learn to trust God. And pretty soon, you will have things so well under control that you're going to fight the Lord's battles. Amen. Think of this. Were there any spoils of battle when he won his own, like when he got the lamb back from the lion? There were certain spoils. Number one, the well-being of the lamb. Number two, a satisfaction of a job well done. Number three, his own personal safety and security. And number four, probably the gratitude of his father. So those were the spoils of that battle. But after we learn to win our own battles with the Lord's help, whose battles do we fight next? You know, when everything's good with you and your kids, it's so easy to turn the TV on. But mm -hmm. that's when the Lord asks you to start fighting his battles. Right. And he always promises you certain spoils. And those spoils are much greater than the spoils of the battle you fought for yourself. Wow. Okay? When the Lord starts, um, let's think about this. When David fought Goliath, that was not his battle. Think about this. He could have slipped back home to Bethlehem and let the army aged men fight the Lord's battle. But when they were too chicken, he said, count on me. I can do it. Go to 1 Samuel 17, 26. This is really important. Because God's going to ask you to fight some battles that aren't your problem. Mm -hmm. The people in this town are in darkness. A lot of them. And that's not your problem. How many are you saved? You're on your way to heaven. But you pick up somebody else's battle because the Lord has given you the wherewithal. Look at verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by and saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Now whose honor is David zealous to defend? He's zealous to defend the honor of the Lord's name. 
And if you look at verse 45, it's the same thing that David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Now, as I said, David's a kid, he's 16 years old. This battle should have been fought by Joshua, Caleb, and their generation. God sent them into the promised land and said, get rid of the giants. And they obviously left some, or, or, or Goliath would not have been there. This battle should have been fought by David's older brothers. They were military age. The moral responsibility to defend the women and kids belonged to his three older brothers, not his dad. His dad was too old. David was a kid. You understand? Yeah. The moral responsibility to defend the women and the kids with the, with, was with the older brothers. But David said, if nobody else is going to fight him, I'm available. I know how the power of the Lord works, and I know how to go in the power of his name. But the interesting thing, okay, listen, you say, oh, you're just making him so noble. <laughs> he was noble. Yeah. Don't you think he was noble? Yeah. He said, you're not going to stick your tongue out of my God. I'll get you. <laughs> Why? Because I've learned to fight some battles. But did you know that before he went, he asked, what do I get if I do it? Mom. Now listen, you said, that's yeah. selfish. Jesus was told what he would get if he went to the cross. Yeah. He said he will divide the booty with the strong. Right. Yeah. I want you to know that when you fight the Lord's battles, God is going to bless you. And I can't tell every way he's going to bless you, but I'll tell you one way I found. That when you use your authority in prayer on somebody else's behalf, when you go back to God and need something, you've got more authority than you've ever had in your life. He gives you promotions. Uh -huh. now, if you don't think that's good, you're not experienced it because it's really good. Before, say this with me, the Lord's battles come with spoils. Okay, look at verse 25. He asked before he goes out, it says, The men of Israel have said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel, and it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and will make his father's house free in Israel. Now, what does that mean? You know what great riches are. You know who the princess is. He's going to get a, marry a princess. Don't you know why that's sounding good for 16-year-old kids? Come on. Come on. But he also is tax-free. His whole father's house no longer has to pay the heavy tax burden to the king. David's obviously interested in defending the honor, but look at verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by and saying, what will be done for the man? Well, they just told him that he wants to hear it again. What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in accord with this word, saying, it is, thus it will be done for the man who kills him. So let me ask you something. Was David interested in the spoils of battle? Yes. Do you, can you at least stay open-minded to the fact that if you'll spend an hour in intercession, believe in God for this town, believe in God for whatever your church needs, wherever you go to church, that you will, in fighting the Lord's battles, be blessed with something. Yeah. 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 David, like I said, could have whined and blamed it on the government. Why is Saul when you really need it, right? right? He could have whined and blamed it on past generations or his cowardly elder brothers who were wimps. And they were wimps. Sometimes God will ask you to do something just because nobody else is willing to do it. True. Keith Moore tells the story, and this is not a message on giving, but he was he saw a need and he said, Oh Lord, he said, Look at that. You want me to give to that need? It was a legitimate need. The Lord said, No, I've ordained somebody else to do it. And I've already spoken to him. It came right down to the wire when he knew he that brother needed. And the Lord said, I want you to empty your bank account and do the whole thing. He said, the whole thing? He said, Lord, you said you spoke to somebody else. He said, yeah, but they will not do it. He's got to have it by tomorrow's so lose the church building. And he said, I knew I could count on you. And on. Keith Moore said, I felt so good. The Lord knew he could count on me. He wired the man the money. They saved the church building. And my point is this. Sometimes God will ask you to take up burdens in prayer that should have belonged to somebody else. And you say, well, this isn't there. Uh, no, but if he can count on you, he'll bless you. Yeah. Hallelujah. David did not whine, and he did not point fingers. He simply said, I will kill him. I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. He's trained my hands for war. I killed the lion and the bear, and his anointing on me can slay the giant just as easily. If he needs to be taken out, I'm your man. Now, the question was, did he still expect the spoil? Yeah, he, he was expecting the riches, the princess, and the tax exemption. It was a package deal. The victory of every battle has certain rewards. Now, you see... Why do you say that? Well, if, if you had a family member who was dying and you prayed your heart out day and night, that's because you expected spoils from the battle. You expected them to get better. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You are fighting with a reward in mind. Come on. Yeah. I'm just saying. When you really love somebody, it is so easy. But there are signs when the Lord asks you to intercede for somebody that he doesn't give you the warm fuzzies. And you do it because you love him. You fight his battles and he rewards you. Amen. Look at 1 Samuel. What made me notice, and I showed you this, but 1 Samuel 18, 14. It said, David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. Well, would you call that a blessing from the battle? Mm -hmm. This is right after he killed the wife, yeah. And then if you go down in verse 17, it says, Saul said to David, here's my older daughter, Miriam, I will give her to you as a wife. And as we said, it didn't happen. Or, well, look at this. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant and fight the Lord's battles. Mm. Saul thought, my hand shall not be against him. But sooner or later, the Philistines are going to kill him, right? Let the hand of the Philistine. And here's my point. David fought the Lord's battle the day at 16 he killed Goliath. That wasn't his battle. It was the Lord's battle. And then he went right on chasing the Philistines out. And we think, well, you know, that's just what people do. <laughs> no, he did that because God had said they don't belong here. Whenever you decide this town belongs to Jesus Christ, hmm. and we're going to get the devil off of people so that they can hear the gospel yeah. and you should get her seat in prayer, you are fighting the Lord's battle. And that is, that is a, a burden that you, you pick up. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, ultimately, David was promoted to the throne because he stepped into the gap to fight for the Lord's people. And over and over, the, the Philistines... Okay, we're, we're going to be done early here. Hallelujah. I didn't think this was a short sermon. Jonathan, if ever you get spiritual people, they look at things the way God does. Look at what David said in, or what Jonathan said in 1 Samuel 19, 4, 5, and 8. In 1 Samuel, he said, Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Don't let the king sin against him. See, um, Saul wanted to kill him. Since he has not sinned against you, and since his deeds have been very beneficial to you. Now look at the next verse. For he took his life in his hand and struck the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. And you saw it rejoice. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death without cause? He took his life in his hand. There are times when you take one hour of your life in your hand and you lay it down for the gospel. I, I, it's not exciting. But do you know what? I believe with all my heart that God always honors and rewards that. Abigail said the same thing to him. That was that wise woman, 1 Samuel 25, 28 to 29. She said the exact same thing. She said, please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord is fighting the Lord's battles. And evil will not be found in you all your days. What did she say David was doing? Fighting God's battles for him. You say, well, I can't fight God's back. Now, there's a flip side to this message that I didn't go into. And that is, every single time we fight God's battles, God jumps in and fights for us. Yeah. All right? Um, we can see this, uh, Joshua 23, 8 to 10. It's the very last scripture about I gave you. You see, it says, you are to clean. Joshua said to the Lord your God, as you have done this day. Next verse. For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you and for you, for no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One of your men puts a thousand to, puts to flight a thousand. Why? For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. When you decide that you're on God's side and you start fighting, God just steps in and says, there's a thousand people there, but if there's just you, I'll be sure you win the battle. God fights for you. Okay? And the, my point is this, that David, for the rest of his life, you know, it's really easy. He got, made a big mistake. One time he didn't go to battle when he was supposed to, and he got into adultery with Bathsheba. But most of the time, for the rest of his life, he went out and he fought the enemies of the Lord, and he got Israel free from them to a point where when Solomon took over the kingdom, he had the entire kingdom free from, from the Philistine enemies. Now think about this. Every spiritual battle has spoils in both realms, in the natural realm and the spirit realm. Never let think the Lord is going to let you go unrewarded for fighting in, in prayer. And you say, well, how do you know that this is um, in prayer? Look at Isaiah 59, 16. Let me ask you this. Do you think God is doing everything he'd like to do on earth today? Why is the devil doing as much as he's doing on earth today? Mm. Okay? 
And he, the Lord, saw that there was no man. And he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. And then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his, his righteousness upheld him. So he said, the thing that astonished God most was that his people had so much power in prayer and were easy. I'm not, I don't, nobody likes to be taller than, you gotta pray, you gotta pray, you gotta pray. But I believe that God desires, we are so well taught. We know our authority. How many of you know your authority? You don't know, have to take a bunch of guns. Then after we get to a place where we are free, we're supposed to go right on in and liberate the city. Mm -hmm. what, same, same book, Isaiah 63, 5, 8, and 9. The Lord says, I looked and there was no one to help. And I was astonished that there was no one to uphold. And my own arm brought salvation to me and my wrath upheld me. Again, he's looking for prayers. And finally, if you go to Matthew, in the New Testament, every time Jesus says, we're to bind the strong man and plunder his stuff. What does that mean? It's got to mean something. I've never heard too many sermons preached on it. Mm -hmm. Matthew 12, 28, and 29, the Lord Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder the house? How do you bind Satan? You take dominion over him in prayer. And sometimes it's more than a 20-second prayer where we say, we bind the spirits of darkness over on the beach. Sometimes you have to just get in and pray in the Holy Ghost and take dominion over it. You see, when, think about this. Moses was a free man. He did not need freedom. But he, the day that he walked into Pharaoh's face, and it was the strongest man on earth, the most powerful man on earth, and said, God said, let my people go. He was fighting God's battle for him. Amen. Because God wanted that people free. And when we walk into the face of powers of darkness that have our loved ones bound and blinded and say, you will let them go and you will let them see the truth dominion over you, you're actually doing warfare and you're actually fighting for their freedom. Does that make sense to you? Just the way Moses fought the Lord's battle by, by facing off with Pharaoh. We fight the Lord's battle by facing off with spirits of darkness. Here he says, how can anyone enter a strong man's house unless he first finds a strong man? He actually said this in Mark 2 in, a, in Luke. Mark 3, verse 20. Jesus came home. He came home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he's lost his senses. Can you ever do battle just because you're trying to do something for God and the devil stirs somebody else up around you? Yeah. yeah. Next verse. The scribes who came from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebub. Now think of everything Jesus is having to wade through. He's a man, right? His people just said he's crazy, and they came to take custody of him. They want to put him away, all right? The scribes, now who are the scribes? They're the religious people everybody admires and respects. They were saying, he's full of the devil. He's possessed by the devil. Beelzebub, it means Lord of the Flies. It's their name for the devil. They say, what am I trying to say? When you really do something for God, sometimes the devil will stir, people, stir stuff up. I hate to say it. And you're paying a price. But do you know what the Lord does? The Lord counts it as fighting his battles if you're on point purpose, in his purposes. Okay? Okay, next verse. He called them to himself and began speaking to them in a parable, saying, how can Satan cast out Satan? Because he was being accused of doing that. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one, now this is the verse to think about, no one can enter the strong man's house. Well, who's the strong man in this parable? Mm -hmm. The devil. What does the devil have that we want? Mm -hmm. People, thank you. Nothing, he has nothing in this world that I want 
fix their people. I don't want his habits or his thoughts or his lust. I don't want anything the devil's got except people. Yeah. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property, rob the souls, unless he first binds the strong man. And then he will plunder his house. Jesus said it. Two of you will agree. But if you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. And here's the problem. I found that just binding them is more than just saying, okay, I bind you. Mm -hmm. i got to pray in the spirit. i got to come after them in the spirit until you get victory over them. Okay? Last gospel that this is recorded in is Luke 11, 21, and 22. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house. Okay, when we square off with demonic forces, is it an easy battle? Is it one of our regions? No. He's a strong man fully armed. Who's he guarding? The people under his blood darkness. When a strong man fully armed guards his house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger. Do you know that the day you get saved, you might have a trouble doing this? Do you know that the first day David ever guarded the sheep, he couldn't have killed Goliath? Mm -mm. No, wait, no, no, listen, just let me think. But did, did, did David learn about the Lord's power when he killed the bear? Mm -hmm. And he learned about the anointing of God when he killed the lion. Mm -hmm. And after a while, he would go and say, I don't care who you think you are, and I don't care how many generations ago you giants should have been gone. I'm here to tell you the anointing of God is greater, and you'll die today. Is that what yeah. he said? Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm telling you, some of you, we've, we've had a hard time with some of these spirits before, but you know what? They're weakening, and we're getting power. Amen. Look at when someone stronger, say I'm stronger, I'm stronger, that attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. The plunder are the people that would love God if they could hear the truth. Yeah. Now, I just want to read you this in closing. We're going to pray for a few minutes. And a lot of times you think, well, why should we pray? That's work. I understand that's work. Boy, do I know it's work. But you know what? Jesus interceded for us. The mm -hmm. night before he went to the cross, instead of saying, oh, God, poor is me, what was me, look at me, I'm going to die. In John 17, he prayed for his body. He said, Lord, help him be one. And he prayed for us. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing, okay, no, I'm going to have the wrong page. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Remember Joseph down in Egypt? You say, well, he didn't fight the Lord's battles. Let me tell you how I think Joseph and Egypt fought the Lord's battles. He conquered bitterness toward his brothers. Can you imagine standing on a slave block and going through all the hell he went through in an Egyptian dungeon because your brothers hated you enough to sell you? Ten of his brothers sold him. And he had such great faith, he said, that's okay. God meant it for, God, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yeah. Joseph fought the Lord's battles when he conquered bitterness toward his brothers. Because without his victory, there would not have been unity for his people, and no Messiah would have risen from his people. Are you following me here? Yeah. That's fighting the Lord's battles. Mordecai fought the Lord's battles when he sat in Susa and sackcloth and ashes and prayed fervently for the Jewish people. Moses fought the Lord's battles when he went face to face with the most fearsome power on earth and said, you let my people go. When we square off with the powers of darkness over a region and demand, let the people go, you, they are going to see the light. The one, he is going to have the ones whom he purchased with his own blood. We're fighting the Lord's battles. Joshua and Caleb were fighting the Lord's battles when they won against unbelief and stood up in faith against the ten doubting spies. They, you see, every time you win a spiritual, does this make sense? Yeah. Have you ever had somebody just dump a whole bunch of unbelief on you at the wrong moment? At that point, you have to come against unbelief and win. Rahab fought the Lord's battles when she lied about the spies' whereabouts. And said she lied? Yes, she did, but she saved their lives, okay? Rahab fought the Lord's battles when she lied about the spies' whereabouts and risked her life to stay theirs, save theirs. Nehemiah fought the Lord's battle when he left the comfort of the palace in Persia and took a dangerous, difficult journey to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Do you understand? Esther fought the Lord's battle the day she appeared before the king without any invitation, trusting in God for his mercy. Joseph and Mary fought the Lord's battles when they agreed to bear a child that appeared to be conceived out of wedlock. People who go against what their natural inclination is in order to 
further the purposes of God, cooperate with the plan of God, are fighting God's battles. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And the thing that, I, it wasn't much of a sermon, I guess, but the thing that I had never seen before, as I understand that he asked us to fight battles. He's asked me to fight some battles. I mean, our family didn't come here because we needed to faith message. We knew the faith message. We knew it worked. We were doing good where we were. We wanted to bring it to an area that hadn't heard the truth yeah. of it, okay? Yeah. So I understood that God asks us to step in where battles need to be fought, even Why? if they're not our battles, okay? Right. But I never understood, all right, that God clearly makes it real, real clear that he's got fine, fine rewards and yes. fine spoils of the battle. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I think we're supposed to pray for a few minutes.